There's a new head coach in Seattle, and his name is Mike McDonald, as the Seahawks opted to end an arrow that was run by Pete Carroll and company for the better part of over a decade, and now we look towards the future of what the Seattle Seahawks may end up looking like in the 2024 season. I'm going to do a little bit of a review on free agency and how I feel the Seahawks did, and then we'll dive into that draft preview, breaking down who I would like to see and or expect to see the Seahawks go after in target in this year's NFL draft. So let's dive right in. You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron. Now here's your host, Ethan Haristadulu. Welcome back to the Greek's Gridiron, and more importantly, a big hello to Seattle Seahawks fans. Today I am doing a draft preview on Seattle, going over what I would like to and expect to see from them going into this year's NFL draft. And before we dive into that, I'm even going to do a little bit of a free agency review as well. Just kind of go over my thoughts. We'll talk about the losses, some of the additions, and how I think it's going to help affect and shape this upcoming draft here in April for Seattle. So I encourage you Seahawks fans, dive into that comment section down below. Let me hear how you're feeling about the Seahawks right now and what you're looking forward to from them in this year's NFL draft. And as a reminder, as always, if you're going to Fanatics or NFL shop, plan on buying something and you want to help support the show, feel free to use my links in the description or the QR code up over my right shoulder here. And if you do so, making a purchase will help me out to potentially earn a discount code for you guys. Now, that being said, diving into the bulk of things, starting with free agency here, we'll kind of just do a little review, talk about what happened in Seattle this offseason, and with a handful of fairly significant losses, there's a lot of retooling that's going on in Seattle here. Obviously, the big one here, guard Damian Lewis inking a massive deal leaving Seattle. We also had Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner depart, so interior linebacking position needs a facelift. We obviously saw some of that being addressed in free agency. Agency. Tight ends Will Disley and Colby Parkinson, two guys that also departed as well. And then when you flip things around, you start looking at some of the signings. They did a pretty good job mitigating some losses, and I will say that uh, I'm not disappointed by any means, but I don't really think I'm really wound or bl- like blown away by any means either. It's very much a, I would say, solid sort of signing group that they have here. Jerome Baker coming from Miami on a one-year $7 million deal. Good signing there. Very athletic, probably looking to potentially give you like the Patrick Queen type role that he had over there in Baltimore, thinking, you know, with Mike McDonald coming over here. That's probably what he's looking for out of Jerome Baker, or at least hoping that he could potentially get. You also have Tyrell Dodson coming from Buffalo on a one-year, $4 million deal as well. They went and addressed the right tackle spot, getting George Font out of Houston on a two-year, $9.1 million deal. He's probably going to be competing with Lucas Abraham on that right-hand side there. Safety, Rayshon Jenkins coming over from Seattle, two-year, $12 million deal. Should see significant playing time as Seattle looks to completely remake the back end of their defense following the departures of both their starting safeties from last year. You went and got center Nick Harris from Cleveland. Uh, I'm assuming he's going to be battling for some sort of you know, center spot. I don't know if it's going to be necessarily starter per se, and that is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So whether it's for starting or maybe a backup role, I don't necessarily know. Uh, And then, of course, D-tackle Jonathan Hankins was another always productive guy. He's been around the league for quite some time. You might not necessarily blow anyone away when you see his name on paper, but he is someone who I feel like just kind of steps into defenses, makes his presence felt, always a contributor, always like a reliable guy on the interior of defensive lines wherever he winds up being. And he just kind of seems to be bouncing around the league year after year, but he's always productive. On top of that, you went ahead and re-signed two big re-signings, I think, for the team as well here. Tight end Noah Font and defensive lineman Leonard Williams, who Seattle traded for last year. But overall, I would say a very solid free agency for the Seattle Seahawks. I mean, you, you do obviously have a lot of losses leaving the table here. Plenty of things to look at, and especially when you look at the cutting of both Quandre Diggs and... And on top of that, you also got rid of Jamal Adams as well. And then, like I mentioned, some of the other guys that were allowed to walk in free agency. There is a lot of work to do defensively that I think is going to probably deserve some serious attention in the draft. But 
when I swap over to looking at the draft itself specifically and where I really think things need to get addressed to really get this team going, it's going to be along the offensive line here. And that's where I'm going to start this draft preview because, yes, there are some needs still defensively, but I do think that they did a pretty good job of addressing a large majority of the needs, and I don't think they're done addressing that, hence what I think a decent part of the back end of the draft might be used for in Seattle. But that offensive line needs some work and in the first round here sitting at pick number 16 I think if you want to build a winning team especially offensively you've got to start from the inside out along the offensive line and Seattle has a very clear need as I kind of alluded to talking about the signing of Nick Harris on the offensive line and specifically at the center position you have Nick Harris now and Olu Oluwatimi uh, Olu Watimi are your only centers on the roster. And between those two guys combined from last season had a whopping 368 total snaps altogether. That's between both of them combined, not individually. Picking at number 16, uh, you have a really good opportunity to go ahead and just take who you deem is the absolute best center in the draft. Now, who that ends up being obviously is up to Seattle, and we're just kind of making guesses here and shooting darts at a dartboard and seeing where they land. But I do think that this is something Seattle should seriously consider, and I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they end up going center in that pick there. It might feel a little bit high for a center, but it's one of those things that center is a position you cannot really overlook. They are the signal caller of your offensive line, and I think addressing that spot at number 16 would do wonders for them offensively especially when you consider that Pittsburgh is picking not too far behind them at number 20 they could also potentially shock some people and take a center as well I know some people think maybe it's going to be corner or wide receiver something like that but they are also in need of a center themselves so I do think going ahead and just taking the guy that you really really like at number 16 might not be a bad idea and who I have circled for this here is going to be Oregon center Jackson Powers Johnson at six foot three, 328 pounds. He's a 32 inch vertical and he ran a five flat 40 yard dash. The guy is an athlete for someone of his size here. And that should be very exciting to you, Seattle fans. He excels in both gap and zone blocking schemes in the run. And on top of that, he is a tone setter. He's able to overwhelm defenders with his size and athleticism. And he's great of taking care of pass rushers and setting the middle of that pocket for his quarterback. And on top of that, if you need to, when it comes to like screens and just maybe some of those wonky plays where you're shifting left, shifting right, and it's a rollout to one way or the other, he's really good at pulling. So another plus on top of that. There are some things to be concerned about as far as his game works. Overall, from what scouts are saying, his strength, about average at best, is not necessarily going to blow you away. And that, that typically ha kind of happens when you have those guys that are far more athletic. Maybe their strength th their strength isn't as high, but you know, they're quicker lateral movers. They move a lot better in space. It's kind of like the trade-off that ends up happening there. It's not always the case. There are those freak athletes that have it all, but that tends to be a typical thing where if a guy's more of an athlete and he moves a lot better, typically not maybe quite as strong. And the other issue, he can be a little bit grabby at times, holding calls bit of a concern you obviously don't want to be drawing attention to yourself and getting the yellow laundry thrown at you during games setting your offense back 10 yards but that is something that is going to be worth considering here as well but overall I look at Jackson Powers Johnson and he is a guy that immediately upgrades the center position and yes I know you went and got Nick Harris and you have someone there from last year as well but this is a new regime, and this is something that you really have to consider when you look at the entirety of the roster here. Nobody in the coaching staff is married to any of these guys here. I know Pete Carroll's still there. He's still working through the front office, but it's Mike McDonald's team, and he's going to want to mold it and shape it in his vision. And if he feels that something needs to be done somewhere, it's not like they're going to sit back and go, oh, well, you know, they took this guy last year in the third or fourth round, and, you know, we really thought – no, if – Mike McD if Mike McDonald thinks things need to change, I'm very certain that everyone is going to be more than willing to listen to him. There's a reason they brought him in, and I do think that addressing the center position here with a guy like Powers Johnson, who poses as a fresh and basically fresh start for 
or excuse me, a more than ready and fresh start is what I meant to say there uh, along the O-line, especially at the center position is probably going to be something that's very, very much a welcomed idea in Seattle. So I do think targeting that center position, just knocking it out, getting it out of the way t- take the guy, the best guy that is potentially available at the spot there and solidify it. The offensive line in Seattle has been very up and down over the last handful of years. And I would sometimes say more downs than there were ups. And I think that committing to offensive line is key. With that being said, talking more along the lines of day two, next position I'm going to be focusing at here, we're going to stick on the offensive line. And I know right out of the gates, this is probably not the sexiest by any means of selections. It's a little bit boring, but sometimes boring is good and boring is necessary when talking about making some draft picks and helping to rebuild an offensive line that has just not been great. And on top of that, took some losses this offseason as well. With that in mind, there is a ton of value at a lot of the like premium, more top-end positions in this year's draft. And it's causing guards to kind of have their projection projections pushed down a little bit more than you've seen in recent years. And I think this kind of works out well for Seattle. Being that they're not selecting until pick number, I believe it's 17 in the third round, this is going to kind of put you in a weird place. Now, with that, you look at kind of the situation in the landscape of guards. First, you know, like your first or second best guard, probably not going to be available. You might even lose out in the third one here. So it kind of depends on how things shake out here. But based off what I've seen some from projections and some later round mock drafts, it seems like you might have an opportunity to get yourself at least a very solid and potentially starting quality offensive guard and someone that I really like the idea of Seattle going after here and helping fill that hole that Damian Lewis left behind him is going to be BC's offensive guard Christian Mahogany. At 6'4", 314 pounds, this is a guy who is praised for that explosive first step. He has immense strength and he loves manhandling a Opposing defenders. You look at this guy and he is your prototype mauler. He will bulldoze people over if he is given the opportunity to do so. He is not afraid to get in there and get dirty when it comes to battling in the trenches. On top of that, another guy that's great at pulling when called upon to do so, whatever the play may be, whether it's a power run or just a blocking scheme to one way, whatever it may be, he's a guy that can move quickly enough. Lateral quickness is not the greatest, but it's enough that he's a successful guard that's able to pull as well. He does struggle with some of the more athletic interior defensive linemen that he's faced in his collegiate career. And one thing that I saw pop up from a lot of different scouting reports on him is that his footwork needs refining. But the The good news is that is stuff that you can clean up. The matter of if it gets cleaned up or not is ultimately up to him, but it is something that you can adjust. Like you can't make up for a guy that doesn't have size or like a guy that doesn't have immense strength. Those are things that you're not typically taught. You either have them or you don't. When you break guys down, especially when you start getting into like rounds three, four, five, and six, you're looking at guys that have like the unteachable stuff and then they have the things like footwork or whether it's, you know, certain things that they just mechanically you don't necessarily have the most polish on you can bring in and help clean those things up and that's kind of what I'm looking at here mahogany is kind of a guy that I think you could probably plug in might be a little bit rough around the edges initially especially if you have a rookie center and a rookie offensive guard whether it's left or right side that they have him plugged into that's obviously a little bit of a nail biter but thankfully left tackle is solidified Uh, I'll be curious to see who wins that battle between Abraham Lucas and on uh, on top of that, George Font as well. But your tackles kind of feel like they're sorted out right now. And you just got to have to work out what the interior of your O-line is going to look like. It's probably going to be a bit of a younger core. But overall, I do think that addressing the offensive line between day one and day two with the limited selections that you have is not a bad idea by any means. Again, I know it's not the sexiest of selections in the world, and unfortunately, the needs for Seattle right now are just not the sexiest positions in the world by any means. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, but... It, it this is what is this is what's needed. I feel like Seattle over the last handful of years has just typically had a average at best to not so great offensive line depending on the season and I want to see Seattle get back to having a more dominant lineup front and open things up for Geno Smith, 
and or whoever ends up being quarterback going forward into the foreseeable future if it winds up not being Geno Smith in the long run here. I think addressing the O-line now rather than later is probably in the best interest of Seattle. And then going into day three, we talked a little bit about some of the free agent signings earlier, and I talked about linebacker, and it's not necessarily anything that really blew me away. I think they were very solid signings, but I don't quite think that's all that's going to be done. And while you could argue there's probably some more pressing positions, I kept coming back to this one here because I really like the idea of it. And again, knowing Mike McDonald and where he comes from in Baltimore and just what he had in his defense over there in Baltimore, this is something that I just I kept drawing myself to. And I'm not saying that this is like the most pressing thing, but it's one position of need that I selected and I found a guy that I really liked for it. I do think McDonald wants to try to find some sort of linebacking duo similar to what he had in Queen and Roquan Smith. And there are some athletic linebackers, and this because this isn't the most strong group of guys in terms of the inside linebacking core by any means. And when you look at day three, there are potentially going to be some athletic linebackers still on the board there. And the fact that Seattle picks number two in round four really helps them out in this situation here. And someone that I kept coming back to who's projected as a very late day two, early day three type of guy. I like the idea of potentially snagging UNC linebacker Cedric Gray. At six foot two and 234 pounds, he is looked at as a sideline to sideline type of linebacker. His 4'6 40 might not blow people away, but it feels like his in game speed is much faster than that. He's a guy that was clocked moving over 20 miles an hour on the GPS in game, and he's just overall very athletic with some of the things you see him doing. You can bench press 390 pounds. I mean, the guy guy is an athlete at the simplest of forms so with that you bring in a guy who's athletic praised for his coverage ability by scouts and on top of that everyone seems to think the same thing is a relentless motor he will not just give up he's always go 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 this is someone that you can come in that has some issues that do need addressing don't get me wrong i'm not sitting here saying he's a perfect prospect by any means and one of the things that really needs some work is his overall pursuit angles and form in tackling he has 57 minutes tackles of the last three season 19 just in this past season alone definitely needs to work on that scouts on top of that would love to see him get a little bit better at shedding some of the blocks he gets himself into he kind of gets stuck and he's you know feet in the mud can't get out of them so that is definitely something he needs to work on as well but then again that's more just technical stuff more than anything else and again pursuit of plays he kind of lines himself up at in certain situations that puts him into opportunities that just get blown because he he again over pursues and he's just not where he needs to be to make the tackle and again that just kind of goes back to cleaning up his stuff in terms of just overall tackling as a whole like one big umbrella thing but when you look at it the athletic tools are there he's got experience having started three straight seasons for UNC he was a team captain for them on top of that first team all ACC player in both 2022 and in 2023 back-to-back -back seasons coupled together to tail end his career in college this is a guy that in my opinion fourth round should potentially be there it would be unfortunate if he's not but there are a couple more athletic guys you could look at but from just the tea leaves that I'm looking at here and projections and everything, and this is all this is, a game of projections, it feels like there's an opportunity that he could be there. And again, he has all the things that you can't necessarily teach and a lot of things that just need to be brushed up on and worked up on. But again, this is a day three selection we're talking about here. This is not somebody that you're going to go grab and he's going to start over Jerome Baker and Tyrell Dodson out of the gate. No, but he's going to come in. He's going to learn from those two guys, potentially maybe steal some reps from those guys and hopefully clean up his game a bit and maybe push them for a starting opportunity down the road. But that's, again, day three selections for you. We're not talking plug and play guys here. We're talking meat and potatoes, the guys that'll be good for you in the long term. But... Those are some positions of need that I'm looking at here. Seattle Seahawks kind of have a tougher draft. Not having a second round selection always makes things a little bit more difficult here. But again, Seattle fans, I encourage you, comment down below. Let me hear your thoughts and opinions on free agency. How did they do? What do you want to see from Seattle in this year's draft? What do you expect to see from them in this year's draft? Would love to discuss with you all. But that is it for me. As always, greatly appreciate it. If you made it to the end, I'll see you all.